We're going to hear a story about Jesus when he had gone to the temple in Jerusalem. And the temple is very much like our church here at St. Olaf. It looked a little different, but they were both places that we come to honor God. Now during this time, people had to travel long ways to go to the temple. And do you know what Jesus saw when he got to the temple? People were selling animals. What do you think? What would it be like if you came here this morning and there were cows and sheep and birds out in the entryway? That'd be kind of noisy. Yeah. And smelly. Kind of dirty. <laughs> Good. There were also people there that were called money changers. For people to buy any of this stuff, they had to go to the money changers first. And these people were not very honest people. They made a lot of money by charging the people more money to, to exchange their money. And that's, not a, that's not very nice, is it? So Jesus was pretty upset. And he says, stop making my father's house a market. A market's kind of like a big, busy mall. And Jesus, that's not how a place to honor God should be, is it? No. At St. Olaf here, we have a couple of people that kind of care for our church. Their names are Troy and Tammy. Do you know them by chance? No? No? They're St. Olaf's maintenance team. They fix stuff, they keep stuff clean, and it's, it's very hard work, and they do a great job. But you know what? It's really kind of our job, too. It's our job not to leave stuff on the floor, and, and if we spill, to clean it up, or, or let somebody know that we spilled. Yeah, accidents happen, but but we shouldn't make Troy and Tammy's job any harder, should we? People can also honor God outside, too. Did you know that? Some people say that they feel closer to God when they're outside in nature. And we can really honor God anywhere, because God created all things. So we can, we can honor God in our homes, outside, in our schools. So we should treat all of these places with respect. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's have a prayer. Can you bow your head and fold your hands and repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for giving us a church where we can come and learn about you. Thank you for Troy and Tammy and all their hard work. Help us to treat all your creation with respect. We love you, God. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Have a good day, you two. How cute was that? Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Maybe we can melt a little snow today. This is the third Sunday in Lent, and the first lesson is from Exodus 21 through 17. After escaping from slavery, the Israelites came to Mount Sinai, where God teaches them how to live in the community. The Ten Commandments proclaim that God alone is worthy of worship. Flowing from God, the life of the community flourishes when based on honesty, trust, fidelity, and respect for family, life, and property. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or in the earth below, or in the waters beneath. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousands generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of your Lord of, of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold any guiltless who misuses his name. 
Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony to your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The second lesson today is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. The word of the cross is pure foolishness and nonsense to the world because it claims that God is mostly revealed in weakness humiliation, and death. But through such divine foolishness and weakness, God is working to save us. The center of Paul's preaching is Christ crucified. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us, us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. St. John, the second chapter. St. John writes, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and and cattle, he scattered the coins out of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, for zeal, zeal for your house will consume you. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove that your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoke about was the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus spoke. Here ends the reading of the lesson. Please be seated. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the risen Christ. Amen. I noticed it again last summer. No big deal, really. Just one of those things that we've all seen scores of times 
in the heat of the, of the summertime. But there it was again, about a quarter to a half a mile ahead of me, water, a river, or maybe a blue lake or a pond spread out over the top of the road. I drove on. For a few seconds, it looked as if I was closing in on it. I started to look for a curve in the road to get around it. But then, as quickly as it appeared, it was gone, a mirage. From a distance, it looked as real as could be, cool, peaceful, lapping up against the pavement. It was there, and it was gone. And then a few miles down the road, there it was again, and it was gone again. And for the next couple of hours, this little game played itself out, appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing, like it was teasing me. Well, I thought about this as I was sitting there sipping on my Cokes and driving in my air-conditioned car and, and, and listening to the radio. But, you know, I wondered, what if I was really in a desert and I was alone without my car and my air conditioning, my radio, my Diet Cokes? What if I were one of those characters like you see in the old movies, stranded and without shade or water, and the pond would appear and I would follow, only to find that at the last mo moment the water turns to sand? And over and over again, this would happen, appearing and disappearing. And that pond looked so real that I might even ignore genuine signs that would truly lead me to safety and instead follow the mirage until I died. Hold that thought. When we pick up the story in today's first lesson, the Israelites are out in the desert. Now, this is a real wilderness. It's not a forest fenced off and protected by the United States Park Service. This is truly an untamed place. Hazards are everywhere. Hot, blistering sun to suck the life from weary travelers. Wild animals to th that would threaten to harm or devour. It was a parched land. It was a desolate land and there was nothing there to support life. But you know, I believe that of all the desert's hazards, the most dangerous is the mirage, an image set on the horizon that gives false hope, that looks to be an answer or a quick escape from trouble, but there, in the end, it's just an illusion that sends us deeper into danger. Mirages are hazardous because they look real. And we find ourselves staking our lives on their promises. And in the process, ignoring true things that provide real safety. Now I know the scriptures record nothing of mirages, at least not in this story. But I think that God knew that something like mirages would beguile his children. They're traveling through a desolate place. And God knew that the Israelites would begin to see things that were not really there and to believe in things that really did not provide and to worship and trust that which was not God. Take, for instance, a story just before this, very first days out in the wilderness. The whole group of travelers are complaining against God, and they're taking these complaints to Moses. What will we eat, they said. Our Egyptian slave masters gave us three square meals a day. We had leeks, we had cucumbers, we had all sorts of good food. But God has brought us out to this desert to kill us. This is a mirage. I mean, when slavery begins to look like real comfort and real provision, what else do you call it? This was just the first of many illusions. The journey through the desert is hard, and in such a place, false promises 
begin to look real. And so we read in today's lesson, God has spoken to them. At the beginning of this journey, he says to them, listen to my voice, keep my promise, because you will be my own among all people, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then today's lesson, God goes on. The Lord provides guidance and direction. He gives them the Ten Commandments as a sign of his promise. My friends, contrary to popular belief, this is not a set of rules. It's a reality check for people who live with mirages all around them. The Ten Commandments are there for protection so that as God's people travel through this desert called life, they might see the illusions that life has for them for what they really are. And so, for instance, in the wilderness, where successful people worship golden calves and trust things over a father's loving care, the Lord gives them a reality check. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no others before me. And in the wilderness, where words are devalued and the name of God is thrown around as though we are in charge, the Lord gives a reality check. I am the Lord your God. Do not take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And in the wilderness, where relationships carry little meaning, where what is most valued is the mirage of self, self protection, self reliance, self interest. Here, the Lord gives a reality check. Honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Listen to my voice. Keep my promise. For you will be my own among all people, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Reality checks. Exposing mirages. Showing people what's real. And so it is for us. Now I know 3,500 years have come and gone, since Israel was forced from slavery. But the experience of life tells me that we are not all that different from those people. We, like they, are travelers passing through this little thing called life. It is a desert with more mirages than I can count, illusions that have us passing that have us trusting paths that appear to offer life and hope, but would instead destroy us and take us from a God who loves us and cares for us. And I believe that's precisely why in this journey, God has called us to be different. Not eccentric, but different. To see through the illusions and trust in unseen, yet ultimately true things. Listen to his voice. Keep his promise. Follow his commandments. To be set apart, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. He does this not to make us jump through a bunch of holy hoops, but to protect us as a father would protect his children. To guide us as a parent guides their young. Let us all pray. Lord, take my hand and lead me upon life's way. Direct, protect, and feed me from day to day. Without your grace and favor, I go astray. So take my hand, O Savior, and lead the way. 
Amen. in the front of the books, page 121 in the front of the book. In holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father liberates us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. In the waters of baptism, we are reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. As we live with him and with his people, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Do you present Weston for the sacrament of holy baptism? If so, answer, we do. In Christian love, you have presented Weston for baptism. You should therefore faithfully bring him to the services of God's house, teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. As he grows in years, you should place in Weston's hands the Holy Scriptures, and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith, that living in the covenant of his baptism and, with, and in communion with the church, Weston may lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you as parents and as sponsors promise to fulfill these obligations? If so, answer, we do. We do. The Lord be with you. And also Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water you nourish and sustain us and all living things. By the waters of the flood you condemn the wicked and save those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the bondage to sin and death and has opened the way to the joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit so those who are baptized here today may be given new life. Wash away the sins of this child who is cleansed by this water and bring him forth as an inheritor of your glorious kingdom. To you be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. I ask you now to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you as parents and as sponsors renounce the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? If so, answer, we do. People of God, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? believe in God, the Holy Spirit. Wesley Grant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, buddy. Weston Grant, child of God, you are marked to the cross of Christ and sealed with his love forever. Need to feed this boy. He's going to waste away. This uh, candle is a symbol of a new light that's in our congregation, the light of Weston. And as we light it, we remember the words of Jesus. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's all pray. O oh God, giver of all life, let the kindness upon the father and mother of this child. Let them ever rejoice in the gift that you've given them. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness for Wesley. Strengthen them in their own baptism so that they may share eternally with him the salvation you have given them. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. Normally I'd just hold him up, but we've got him in a good position right now. So this is our, our new brother in Christ, Weston. Good looking guy, isn't he? baptism, God has made this new brother a member of the priesthood we all share in Christ Jesus, that we may proclaim the praise of God and bear his creative and redeeming word to all the world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>